you would go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to continue in our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the love chapter of the Bible. Uh, it's used in many weddings. Maybe some of you had it, some reading from it in your own wedding. We're just going to continue walking verse by verse through this chapter. Um, and this morning we're going to focus in particular on verse 5 because there's actually a lot packed in here. So if you would follow along with me in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. This is what it says, and it's talking about love here. So everything this chapter is referring to is referring to love, the love that we're to have toward other people. It says this. It's talking about love. It says, love, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. We're just going to kind of walk through piece by piece what's going on in here and try to kind of unpack a little bit what this verse is teaching us here this morning. The first thing says that love is not rude. Uh, Without elbowing the person next to you or pointing across the room, have you ever come across somebody who's been a little rude to you? Or maybe you've been rude to somebody else along the way in your life. I know we've all said things we shouldn't have said. We've done things we shouldn't have done. And we've been rude to other people. Uh, But we need to learn more and more to improve in this area of being uh, more courteous toward other people. Because this is a big part of the love that God wants us to have for one another. See, some acts of rudeness that people do are a little more obvious and blatant. And some of them are a little more subtle. I know at uh, not too long ago at my other job, I came across what I would consider kind of maybe a little subtle rudeness. Um, I was actually, I had finished up work, and uh, I'm kind of on a commission basis, and when I finish my work, we, uh, sometimes we have to charge people, and sometimes they buy uh, multiple workout sessions at the same time, but uh, anyway, so I finished this workout uh, with this person, it was actually their child who I'd taken through this workout class that we do, and so here I was, I was waiting afterward because I had to get payment from this person, and so I waited for this person's mom to show up. And I, I finished work at about 6.30, and it was my time to go home. You know, it was kind of my off time. And I was ready to go home and kind of move on with my night and just kind of go home and relax. But uh, I ended up having to wait a little while uh, for this person to show up, about 15 or so minutes. It wasn't really a big deal. You know, I was just kind of checking email or something like that. And so I get there to receive the payment and start putting in the information. We don't have, like, a swiper. We actually have to type it in. I had to type in the credit card number and all that stuff. And uh, I was having some problems. I uh, put all the information in and I hit process and it didn't go through. And so I was like, all right, let me try it again. And so it took a couple minutes. This person had to wait a a couple minutes uh, as I tried to fumble around and get her uh, credit card to go through. Well, this person, she wasn't like mean about it. She didn't like insult me, but you could just tell like in her attitude started to like really tense up a little bit. And uh, she was just finally kind of like cut me off and was just like, you know, I got I to go. We got to go. And she just really just kind of cut me off and just kind of, you know, um, just kind of left. She didn't like say anything mean, but her attitude kind of tensed up a little bit. And uh, she just said, you know, what, I'll do it this other day. And she talked about like in a couple of days when she comes back, she'll deal with it. And so anyway, a couple of days later, uh, she comes back and uh, I go through the same process again. I put it through one time. And uh, didn't go through. And I was like, she was like getting all tensed up again. She's like, do you want me to read it to you? You know, she's kind of just getting all tensed up on me again. And uh, I finally realized that I was actually doing it wrong. And I was actually putting, you know how sometimes they have the, uh, the when the card starts and then dash, the ne- then the expiration date. Well, I was actually putting in the front date of when the card got started. And that's why it wouldn't go through. So it's actually my fault. And she probably should have read it to me because I was just being... Uh, kind of dumb about it, but it was just kind of her. She had this little attitude about it, and I'm not the person to kind of like get into it or go back and forth, because if I do, I'll lose business, obviously, in this kind of situation, so I was just like, all right, and, uh, but it's kind of like a little example like that. Um, it's kind of like what I would call like kind of maybe being subtly rude. Uh, the other times that rudeness can be a little more blatant, uh, like the time I was actually driving up here Easter Sunday morning to come preach, um, I was coming from Mount Pleasant. I came across the uh, Cooper River Bridge, and I'd just gotten on I-26. And overall, I'd say I'm a pretty good driver. I mean, overall, I'm a pretty decent driver. I get a few tickets here and there. 
Uh, I've had a couple wrecks. I had one this year. It was pretty bad. Uh, but overall, I'm a pretty decent driver. Uh, but anyway, uh, this morning, you know, here I was on I-26 coming up towards Summermill. You know, there's two lanes on the highway and everything. And so I kind of start to shift over to change lanes. And then as I'm kind of in the process of changing lanes, I look last second, and there's a car right next to me. And so I kind of like jerked back in place in my lane, and obviously this person like honked and everything. And so they went up ahead of me along the road. And, uh, and about, within about a mile or so, I kind of just sped up and started to pass by this person. And as I pulled up next to them, and this is kind of funny to me, I think stuff like this is funny. As I pulled up next to them, I looked over at this person. I stuck my hand up and I was like, sorry. I was like, mouth the word sorry to this person. And uh, my, my apology, my spirit-filled, loving apology was met with a, uh, a hand sign, if you will. It was met with a little hand sign, uh, coupled with some very clear words to go along with that hand sign that were directed right at me. And stuff like this, you know, it was, it was a blatant rudeness, but it's something that just really didn't bother me. I thought it was funny, and the fact that what made it even funnier is like this little 20-year-old guy this like little kind of scrawny looking guy and it's kind of, you know, kind of made me feel good to know I probably could have handled him um, if push had come to shove. But it's just kind of funny, this guy had some little girl in his car and he's showing off and showing her, you know, he's kind of the boss of his car. And so anyway, I just passed on, I just moved on and I came up here, you know. Was, the funny thing about the context of this, I was like listening to like Christian music and I was preaching on Easter Sunday, so I was like getting in the zone spiritually. It was just kind of funny just that that happened on my way up here. Um, but that's just kind of like a reactional rudeness. This guy, I did something. It was my fault. It was bad driving on my behalf. This person uh, was just blatantly angry about it. But some people get in the habit of being cons uh, consistently rude. Some people just kind of develop these habits where they're just rude to one person after the other. And when you come across them, uh, they kind of rub, they have a tendency to rub people the wrong way a lot of times. And I know when I was working at a gym about, uh, I guess it was about five years or so ago, I was kind of like the front desk guy. And I was the only one who worked there. They just had one person kind of oversaw the gym, you know, the daily operations and stuff. And there was this one woman who would always come in this gym. And here she was, she was probably in like her early 50s or so. And uh, I don't think she worked. And she basically, I guess, she had a lot of time on her hands, and what she did with her time, she would come to this gym and do her little workout, and she was always starting up trouble. She was always complaining about something, whether it was the temperature in there, whether this machine was a little too dirty. It was a one thing after another. This person was just blatantly rude, complaining, and not only was she complaining, she was stirring up other people in the gym to kind of like get them all mad at me or mad at the gym, and they were always calling like the upper management of the gym, because this was actually a gym they have several... Uh, gyms in the Mount Pleasant area, so there's like six or seven gyms, and this is just one of them, so they were, this woman was always complaining and starting up trouble, and sometimes we can fall into that trap sometimes, where we become always kind of this rude person that we know we shouldn't be from time to time. We all have imperfections. We all fall short of God's perfection. We all fall short uh, of being fully loving all the time, and sometimes we say things and do things uh, and they can start to become habits if we're not careful. And sometimes we can get caught up. Maybe some people, sometimes we're around other people that they can kind of stir this kind of rudeness up. Someone will be rude, they'll always be complaining, they'll always be negative about something. When we find ourselves around those people a lot of times, sometimes they can start rubbing off on us a little bit. Next thing you know, we start complaining, we start becoming rude. But God wants us to take that higher road in those situations. So if you're in a situation where maybe some of your friends are always being negative, maybe it's family members, maybe it's co-workers, or wherever it may be in your life, sometimes we need to be careful to take the higher road. Uh, sometimes when there's the temptation to maybe be rude and mistreat other people. Because Jesus tells us in John 13, 35, that by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In other words, our representation of Christ into this world is how we love and treat other people. So this verse says that love is not rude. Secondly, it says love is not self-seeking. And another version actually of the same passage says that love does not demand its own way. Love is not all about 
self. Love is not a, a, a love, true love rooted in Christ is not a love of ultimatums. Uh, and as I was kind of coming across this, uh, this, this uh, truth about love not being self-seeking, I came across uh, some stuff uh, that I was kind of looking into about some actors and some famous people and some of the kind of the outlandish demands that they have. And I thought it was just kind of, almost kind of comical that some of these demands that some of these famous people make. And I'm going to share a couple with you, but as I share them, I'm going to refer to them anonymously as so-and-so, just because I don't want to get up here and bash any celebrities. Uh, uh, But anyway, so I'm going to read some of these kind of outlandish demands that some of these famous people that most of us have heard of uh, do. Uh, The first one talks about uh, a pop singer. And it says, so-and-so demands one box of mints, one bag of Doritos, and seven clean and secure dressing rooms for her entourage at each show. So that's uh, this one pop diva's demands. And then it talks about another pop diva. And there's actually several pop divas who have these kind of outlandish demands that I thought were kind of funny. Um, it says, here's, here's another one. It says, so-and-so demands a lot more, referring to the one I just mentioned. It says, before public appearances, her path must allegedly be prepared in advance with the scent of gardenia and her hotel sheets must be Egyptian cotton with a thread count of at least 250. Recently, at a royal variety show in London, she allegedly demanded even greater security than the queen. Not surprisingly, she received short shrift from the police. This is talking about someone that we've all heard of. as are her demands, having Egyptian cotton with a thread count of 250. Uh, here's another one. Another. This is actually a, a, a girl's singing group. It says, and it refers to the group, says, they refuse to drink from plastic or styrofoam and always demand fresh ginger root and a jar of honey on tour. What that means, I have no idea. And it says even probably the most famous one of all, or one of the most famous ones of all, it says, so-and-so has a special attendant in her dressing room just to hand her towels And at publicity appearances, so-and-so demands that all posters of her pop rivals be taken down, especially those of, and then it names another pop diva. Uh, And then it goes on, and I had a couple more that it goes on, these outlandish demands. Uh, Not surprisingly, a lot of them are these pop singers. But another one was actually an actor, a famous actor that we've all heard of. It says, so-and-so once had a meal from his favorite Indian restaurant in London flown in by private jet to Italy where he was on holiday with so-and-so and and named his then-famous wife. Those are some kind of outlandish demands that these people make, and it's almost kind of funny. I mean, I guess if you have that kind of money, I guess you can kind of do those things if you want. Uh, But this is just kind of a representation of how sometimes we can become uh, this kind of aura of self-entitlement sometimes that we can even develop in our own lives. And I know I had this kind of early on in my, uh, I've kind of shared some of this before, when I first kind of got my calling to preach and everything, I, God had given me a clear-cut vision. One time I was praying, there was actually a, a time in my life where I was praying and God gave me a clear-cut vision for my life. And as soon as that happened, I started to become so obsessed with this vision. I became obsessed about it. I became so obsessed about it that I've started to neglect where God had planted me in the present. I became so obsessed with looking to where God was going to take me later on that I wasn't blooming and thriving in the present where God had planted me. And I started to become so self-seeking in this obsession with getting to the pinnacle of where God wanted to take me. But oftentimes we can get so obsessed in that vision that we forget the fact that in order to get us to that vision, God is going to have to take us through some maybe even some smaller roles along the way, some maybe some unglamorous roles along the way to get us to- toward where He wants to take us. And you know, sometimes you hear about people who kind of hike to the top of Mount Everest. You only hear about them getting to the top. You hear about so-and-so, they made it to the top. What you don't hear about is the journey toward the pinnacle of that mountain. You don't hear about the oxygen deprivation, the constant numbness and the suffering from hypothermia and all the problems they had where they were famished, they wanted to turn back, they were tempted to probably call in helicopters to come get them off the mountain. You don't ever hear about the difficulties and the trials they had to go through to get 
toward that vision. And sometimes the same thing is true in our own lives. We become so obsessed to where God wants us to get in the future that we forget to be blooming right where God has planted us. And sometimes when we forget to bloom where God has planted us, it produces a discontentment in our heart. We become unhappy and we become unfruitful all because we're not faithful to God in the present. And Jesus says that if you are faithful in the little things, you're going to be faithful in the bigger things. But if you're not faithful in the little things, you're sure as heck not going to be faithful to the bigger dreams that God wants to take you to later on in your life. But sometimes this this self-seeking attitude can get in our hearts and start to stray us from where God really wants us to. To go, because in order to get to the great things that God has in store for each and every one of your lives, sometimes you're going to have to take that tedious journey up the mountainside to get there. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not all about self and one's own agenda. Love is about doing what God has called you to do in the present with a faithful attitude. And thirdly, it says, love is not easily angered. And we talked a little bit about this last week, the need to be kind to one another. The Bible says simply be kind one to another. Sometimes it's the hardest thing for Christians to to apply to their life from time to time. So love is not easily angered. What are some things that cause people to get angry? Why do people get angry sometimes? Why do I get angry sometimes? Why do you get angry sometimes in life? One of the reasons people can get angry at times is when things don't go your way. When things don't go our way, sometimes it makes us respond in anger. How many of you can testify that in life you don't always get what you want? Who was that who sang that? Rolling Stones? Maybe, I I don't know, one of those bands, I think it was Rolling Stones, you you don't, or you can't always get what you want. Um, But that's that's the truth of our lives. We don't always get what we want. And I know uh, one day, uh, I was working at this same gym I just mentioned ago, uh, or a little bit ago, uh, I guess about five years ago, I think it was 2007, I was working at this gym, and it was actually, it was a 24-hour gym. Okay, so a lot of times this gym didn't have someone working there. They just let, let the members, they would have this little slider where they slide their card and they can unlock the door and just get in and go work out any time of the day they wanted. Uh, but there was a holiday coming. It was like one of those Monday holidays. It was like, I think it was either like Labor Day or Memorial Day or one of those Monday holidays. And so this is a day where obviously a lot of people have the day off. Uh, but they, I guess they had asked me to work at the gym that day, you know, just to kind of oversee things. Uh, because, you know, at a gym where you can have a membership just card and swipe it in, anybody can kind of come in and just use it. And so here I was sitting there uh, at the desk, and I was actually in kind of a low chair, kind of just hidden. They kind of just had, had me just kind of manning the fort down a little bit. I wasn't really uh, doing much that day. But a woman comes, and this was a regular a member that I saw a lot at this gym. Uh, she slides her car to come in, and she has a man with her, which turned out to be her husband. And being there all the time, I knew that this man was not a member because I pretty much recognized everybody who came in. And so uh, they were kind of like walking in the gym. I think I kind of surprised them because I was sitting there. And I just said, I stopped them for a second. And basically, I ended up not letting these people in. She Basically, what she was trying to do is sneak her husband in for free. You know, it was a more day. No one was going to be there. Let's go work out. I'll get you in my card. And so I stopped him and did my duty and said, basically, you got to pay. And they didn't like that too much. And this woman didn't like the fact um, that her husband had to pay. And what, it, what happened is she ended up getting angry and ended up, they ended up leaving and all that kind of mess. Uh, but the truth of the matter is the bottom line in this situation is she didn't have her way. Uh, obviously, she was doing th- something that was a little kind of shady as far as integrity is concerned, but she didn't get her way, so she got mad and ended up leaving. And the same kind of truth can happen in our own lives sometimes when we don't get our own way, and it makes us mad sometimes. And we need to be careful. Uh, the Bible talks about Uh, being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We need to be slow to become angry because that's the love that God wants us to exemplify to this world. Another thing that can make people angry is when people don't see things the way that they do. 
Um, how many of you saw this last, this past week with the election going on? Especially in the state of South Carolina. A lot of people in South Carolina were not happy about the election because someone who maybe they don't quite agree with on a spiritual standpoint, on a policy standpoint, or maybe on an everything standpoint, some people were not happy because someone won who sees things the way that they don't see. And this, I saw this a lot in seminary as well. When I was in seminary, you'd hear uh, just a lot of criticism going on, uh, especially from these leaders, these pastors. They would criticize other pastors and leaders who did things away in a different way. They basically, they had, they had their churches and their leadership style was a lot different than what their style was, and therefore it led them to be critically angry toward other people. And sometimes these can, things can happen in our lives when someone doesn't necessarily see things exactly the way that we do. Uh, but if, if you come across that type of situation, God wants us to learn to control that anger. And I know I've had some struggles with anger in my own life and being quick to get angry and uh, snapping at just little stuff sometimes. Uh, but God wants us to learn more and more to take that higher road and not be quick to fall in to this anger. Uh, another reason that sometimes we can get angry is when we feel disrespected. When we get, sometimes when someone disrespects us, we get put on the defensive a little bit, and that kind of makes us angry. Uh, how many of you have ever been in a job situation where uh, you felt micromanaged? Anybody ever been micromanaged before? Uh, I know I had a job a while ago um, that I felt, at least, I, I, don't, I don't say I felt, I was micromanaged. It was like everything, was, my supervisor was on top of me about every little thing, and it was like, it was no like, here's your job, let me trust in your abilities to accomplish. It was like, all right, it was just like every little detail of every little thing I did, um, I felt micromanaged. Uh, whether, you know, I'm sure there was times in the job where I was in the wrong, where she was in the right and all that stuff and vice versa. Uh, but the ultimate truth is, is I felt disrespected by it a lot. And it made me mad a lot um, because I felt disrespected. And maybe some of you are going through some situations where you feel like someone's not totally respecting you. Maybe it's at your job, maybe it's at your home, or wherever it may be. Sometimes we go uh, through times in our life where we're going to feel disrespected, and we need to, even more in those situations, learn to take that higher road and learn more and more. And I'm still in the process of learning. I haven't ar arrived by any means. We need to learn more and more to let stuff roll off our shoulders. Um, and I know I need to improve in this area a lot. Um, but I know uh, this can happen a lot in our lives if we're not careful. We can be quick to get angry, just even over trivial stuff sometimes. And fourthly, this verse says, uh, it says that love is not rude, love is not self-seeking, love is not easily angered. And then lastly, it says love keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Um, it's easy to get up here and read that verse, but to actually apply it to your life and to maybe people that have caused you hurt or pain or been insulting toward you, it's a lot more difficult to apply sometimes. And uh, I know I've had times in my life where I've felt hurt. I've felt I've had the actions of somebody else cause me some problems in my life. Um, it caused me even long-term problems, just I struggle with bitterness, I struggle with holding a grudge, and I know I've had a time in my life where I had to make a conscious decision on a regular basis to forgive somebody. Because one thing I learned, if someone you're truly close to, someone you truly look up to, or someone you're just, you have a close relationship with, when they do something that hurts you, it's going to hurt a lot more than when someone who you don't really know that well um, does something that causes you problems. I don't know this happened in my life where someone did some things, or actually a couple of people did some things um, that caused me a lot of problems. And to be honest, I remember when this happened, this was a while ago, I made the conscious decision. I remember as soon as I was going through all this, I was full of anger, I was frustrated, I was upset, I was all these things, and then some. And as soon as I was going through all these things, God brought to, to my mind that verse that Jesus talks about. If you don't forgive others, our Father in heaven, 
will not forgive you. So I was like, all right, I, I got to forgive. I got to forgive. And I just made the conscious, purposeful decision to forgive these people. And one thing I learned in all this, because I was truly hurt, is that forgiveness is a process. It wasn't just one little prayer, and I'm up and prancing on my merry way. These feelings of bitterness, uh, these feelings of anger kept coming back as I kind of rehashed in my mind time and time again of what these people did to me, and I felt that it was unfair. Uh, But I had to keep making that effort to forgive these people and to not hold that grudge and it took a while. It took a while. I went through, it was a long period of time before, before I finally had it just fully flushed out of my system. We need to be careful uh, not to hold these grudges. It doesn't matter if someone did something just atrocious to you when you were younger, someone abused you, someone didn't treat you right, someone abandoned you. No matter how long ago it may have been, uh, sometimes those same feelings, when you think about the injustice come back to your mind, you can start to get that anger. You can start to get that frustration and bitterness. You can start to stir back up inside of you. But no matter what someone has done to us, we need to always forgive. This verse says that love keeps no record of wrongs. Uh, but sometimes it's a lot easier to point out Uh, the the shortcomings of other people and how other people mistreated us than it is to even recognize our own shortcomings sometimes. Because I can kind of look at my life a little bit and these things that were done to me that I felt were unfair and unjust, I can look back and see where I've kind of done some similar things to other people in my own life. Uh, But sometimes it's a lot easier to focus on what others have done to you than, than than it is to focus on what you have actually done to others. And Jesus actually talks about this in Matthew 7. Uh, This is what he says in verses 3 through 5. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? And he says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. And instead of focusing on what someone may or may not have done to you, sometimes it's better to focus on uh, maybe our own eye and how we're treating other people. So what is it in your life that maybe God wants you, uh, maybe there's an area of improvement. Maybe we've talked about something that's kind of resonated with what you're going through or something in your life, and maybe you realize that you've fallen a little short in this area of love. Uh, maybe, maybe it's rudeness. Maybe it's not being nice to someone you should be nice to. Maybe even uh, someone in your family. Maybe some, one of your coworkers. Or maybe it's just being more respectful to those who are in authority over us. Uh, maybe some of us need to improve in the area of being just nicer to other people. Or maybe it's that self-seeking, kind of self, uh, self-entitlement thing sometimes we can fall into. Sometimes we get so concerned with our own agenda sometimes. Uh, that we forget uh, where God has placed us and and to enjoy uh, the present role that God has placed us in. Maybe some of you uh, need to improve in the the area of self-seeking. Maybe maybe being a little bit more selfless in what God has called you to do. Or maybe it's the anger. Uh, I know this is something I had some major issues with in the past. I can't say I fully arrived, but maybe some of you have some struggles with anger as well, and you're easily angered and quick to get angry. Um, That's not who God has called us to be. And maybe as this morning as we go into a time of prayer, maybe that's something that you need to address with God. Um, Because when we actually humble ourselves and address and be honest with God, that, hey, you know, I'm I'm a little short here, God. Uh, Maybe I need a little bit of help here. It's usually when we humble ourselves like that that God is able to get inside of us and bring that renewal, bring that spiritual, he starts breathing that spiritual life into those areas in which we are weak. And then it says, uh, it talks about keeping record of no, not, not keeping record of wrongs. Maybe some of you have had someone do something to you recently, or maybe it's been something that's been a long time ago and you're still struggling with that forgiveness to let go of the past. Who is it that God wants you to forgive once and for all and keep no record of wrongs.